Okay, so our speaker today is Rabbi Adam Shalom, who is a uh, humanist, humanistic rabbi who studied under Sherwin Wine, um, who was very well known for being a uh, atheist rabbi. Um, he's the rabbi of a humanistic congregation in uh, Chicago, which is called Kol Hadash. Uh, he's also the Dean of the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism. And uh, today he'll be sharing with us uh, a talk about his new book that he, well, new book that he edited uh, called A Provocative People, uh, A Secular History of the Jews. So, um, Rabbi Adam Shalom. Thank you. Thank you very much. I promise not to use this bell unless absolutely necessary. <laughs> unless we get rally. Huh? And uh, I do want to let you know, I'm sure many people here have some questions about humanistic duties in general, how we do what we do, how it relates to general humanism. I'm happy to talk. I talk about that a little bit in talking about the book, but we can answer questions about that as well as about the book itself. Um, and also, just for the commercial announcement, um, we do have some examples of other books that our institute has published here on a variety of subjects. You're welcome to flip through them here. We have catalogs you're welcome to take with you. They're all available on Amazon as well, or I have charge slips here, or cash or check are accepted, um, as well as multiple copies of the Provocative People book. But I'm happy to sell you any one of these. I don't need to take them home. Uh, I'm happy to uh, save my back the uh, luggage weight. Um, but the copies of Provocative People we do have, <clears throat> they're $25, which includes the tax, and obviously no shipping. Uh, so it is, uh, if you are interested in the topic, uh, worth considering uh, taking a look at one. But I'll repeat that commercial announcement at the end of the talk. When I was in college as an undergraduate, I took a class with a friend on biblical archaeology. The class was an academic study of the earliest Jewish history as evidence could reconstruct it. We looked at biblical literature in the context of ancient Near Eastern literature from Babylonia and Assyria. We looked at what evidence there was, or in this case was not, for an exodus from Egypt and the patriarchs. Now the fact that all this archaeology did not confirm, in fact undermine, many of the claims of the Bible was news to my friend, but was actually old news to me. Now he had been just as involved in his Reformed Jewish congregation as I had been in my humanistic congregation, and I grew up in a humanistic congregation under uh, Rabbi Wine's leadership. His rabbi and my rabbi went to the same rabbinical seminary. They were both educated in a reform style of Judaism. They may have even had the same professors at Hebrew Union College. What was the difference? Well, my rabbi Sherwin Wine wanted his congregation and his students, his young students and his adult students, to know the real history of the Jews, not just the traditional version of what people thought, how they came to be. Where did the Jews really come from? Who really wrote the Torah? If it wasn't Moses taking dictation on Mount Sinai, if it was an evolution over a long period of time with many sources. What happens to Jewish history if cultural evolution was always a part of the Jewish experience and not only in modern times? And it turns out the real history of the Jews is a fascinating story. It turns out we originate in Canaanite culture, not in opposition to the Canaanites, but in evolution out of the Canaanites. The story of the destruction of the Jerusalem, its rebuilding, and its destruction again. The clash between the Maccabees on one side around the story of Hanukkah, but on the other side, not simply the Greeks, but Hellenized Jews, Jews who were sympathetic to the ideals of Greek culture and philosophy. The miracle of the light story, just to mention it since it's seasonal, is invented many centuries later. If you read Josephus, who lived about 100 years after the Maccabees, if you read the books of Maccabees themselves that they commissioned to be written, there is no mention anywhere in those books of any miracle with any lights. But they do give a reason why it's eight days long. In one version it says, as, t as Solomon dedicated the temple, as described in the book of Kings, so did they dedicate this temple. And Solomon's dedication festival was eight days long. If Hanukkah means dedication, it was a re repeat of the first version, and so they made it eight days long. The other reason that was given is that when they were in the process of attacking Jerusalem, they were in the hill country, they weren't able to celebrate the holiday called Sukkot which in English is often rendered as tabernacles, where you're supposed to build booths and live in them for seven days, and the eighth day is a closing day. Again, an eight-day holiday. So they celebrate Sukkot out of season. It's like Christmas in July. And that's why it was eight days, even though it was uh, later in the schedule than normally predicted. So in both cases, you have reasonable explanations why it's eight days long and has nothing to do with the miracle. The miracle gets added by the rabbis many centuries later. We'll talk about why in a little bit. 
But you have other examples too. As the early rabbis compile the Bible and choose what books in are in and what books are out, they're making political choices that advantage them and disadvantage their opponents. You have diasporas all over the known world, created by Jewish participation in medieval mercantile culture from India to uh, Northern Europe and even to the Americas. You have the tensions and dynamics of European enlightenment and emancipation, the disasters and the triumphs of the 19th and 20th centuries. And you have all of this and more in A Provocative People, A Secular History of the Jews, which is Sherman Wine's last book. When he died in 2007, it existed in a manuscript form, but it had not been put together, had not been edited, had not been compiled, had not been proofread, had not been laid out, had not been indexed, had not been proofread again, and proofread again, and finally uh, published. Now, Sherman Wine was raised in a conservative congregation, a very traditional home, in the intensely Jewish neighborhoods of Detroit. He became a reform rabbi, a little more liberal denomination, serving in Detroit and Windsor, Ontario. He uh, was all but his dissertation at the University of Michigan in philosophy as well. And he was between going in the philosophy route or staying as a congregational rabbi, when in the 1960s, he founded a congregation called the Birmingham Temple, which quickly became the first humanistic Jewish congregation uh, in the world. In some ways, you could say he found his calling, even though nobody was on the other end of the phone. <laughs> it was a good fit for him. He became widely known in metropolitan Detroit as a public lecturer on a wide range of topics, Jewish and general, philosophy, history, world culture, politics, from ancient Greece to the 21st century globalization. And he was very active in the general humanist world as well. He was a signatory to Humanist Manifesto II and Humanist Manifesto III. He helped to create the Humanist Institute in the early 1980s, which has trained leaders ever since. Uh, he or organized a group called Voice of Reason in the early 1980s, which merged with another group to become Americans for Religious Liberty, which is still out there doing good work. And in 2003, he was the American Humanist Association's Humanist of the Year. So he certainly has been very involved in the general humanist world as well. Now, Sherwin Wine took the pursuit of truth very seriously. Truth in philosophy, truth in science, and truth in his people's history. So what made him infamous as the atheist rabbi, as Vic mentioned, in Time Magazine? Well. What's the philosophy behind this history as well as our movement? There are three steps. The first is he was willing to say out loud, in English, his philosophic conclusion, which is that we are the only conscious force for good in the universe. There's no benevolent divine personality that we can see evidence for that directs or intervenes in history, that parts sees, that writes Torahs, that chooses peoples, that rewards the righteous or punishes the wicked, that wants to be praised, that answers prayers, that cares what you eat or what you wear. Who knows if you've been sleeping, who knows if you're awake, who knows if you've been there. <laughs> now, when you have that perspective, this transforms your understanding of Jewish history. Because now the Jewish people made the Bible, not the Bible making the Jewish people. Jewish survival was not a miracle, it was from tenacity, it was from endurance, it was from creativity and having valuable skills like male literacy. There was a slogan that used to be used at the Weizmann Institute for Science in Israel that applies to this understanding of Jewish history as well. Miracles happen. They take a lot of work. <laughs> now, the second step was not merely willing, being willing to say this out loud in English, but he was willing to say it in Hebrew and to apply it to his Jewish life. You can change the liturgy. You can change the practice. You can change the Passover Haggadah. You can change the curriculum in the Sunday school to reflect these beliefs about Jewish history and about the world. You can be consistent. You can have personal integrity with your Jewish cultural connections and your humanistic approach to life and the past. So you don't just teach adults the archaeological truth on the side in secret in closed rooms with no windows. You can talk about it from the pulpit. You can make it part of your major curriculum. You can teach it in the Sunday school, change your Passover Seder to reflect archaeology and not just the tradition of the story. And you don't give up your ownership of being Jewish to someone else. You don't have to do it the way people thought it was always done. You can have your history and your Hanukkah too. In the end, what it produces is a willingness to create and even to celebrate the new Jewish creativity and culture in the last 200 years since the Enlightenment. Because in many ways it can be more relevant to us than words and ideas from 2,500 years ago which were written in the ethos of 2,500 years ago. And the new secularized reality of Jewish life may be understood as a natural outcome of Jewish history and not a disaster where Jews are going to vanish because they've changed so much. It's a natural outcome of how they've evolved. And the last step that was important 
is that to understand who the Jewish people really are today, we need to find out what really happened, and not just what we thought happened. Think about the rage of genetic testing today. People want to find out where their family was really from, and often when they do these tests, they find out surprises, family stories that were not true, or family stories that were true and are, are being confirmed. So now compare that to the importance of archaeology to confirm whether the Bible is right or wrong. Now we need to find out what really happened. So I'll give you an example. In the Middle Ages, the family of Maimonides, who was one of the most famous rabbis and philosophers in uh, the Middle Ages, in fact, um, Thomas Aquinas, um, Avicenna, or Ibn Sina, and Maimonides all lived in the same time period and knew each other's work. They were all creating a kind of Aristotelian or neo-Aristotelian philosophy in the Middle Ages in response to the rediscovery of Aristotelian texts through Arabic and Greek uh, translations. Well, Maimonides is one of these major figures in this period, but he's also a major sage in Jewish life who wrote a masterful code of Jewish law, commentaries to the Bible, response to literature, answering key questions people would have. He was the preeminent rabbi of his age. But early in his life, when he was a child, his family was living in Spain. And an invasion of fanatical Muslim Berber tribesmen named the Almohades invaded southern Spain, and including the area where the Maimonides, uh, Maimonidean family lived. Now, that family stayed there for a couple of years, and then moved from there to North Africa, where the Almohads were from, and still in force, and then eventually to Egypt, where they were able to join the Jewish community in Egypt. And the question is raised, did Maimonides' family, including Maimonides as a young man, actually convert to Islam? Well, it may have been the case that they had to because when the Almohads invade, they put the Quran on the edge of their sword and said, convert or die. You know, pick the Quran or you get the sword. And so most likely, their family did convert. And that's how they were able to move along where the uh, tribesmen had come from to get to Egypt and then reemerge as Jews later on, a sort of prefiguration of a lot of what are called Moranos or secret Jews during the Inquisition period. Now, if you take the very pious perspective, that the great sage Maimonides could have never converted, there's no possible way, well then you're going to miss out on understanding a lot of his writing because there are times when he's very sympathetic to people living under Islam and the difficulties they face. And there are other times when he's very angry and bitter in responding to a certain provocation that Islamic culture presents against the Jews. So you can see that his biography makes a big difference in understanding his writings and understanding his writings because of the impact he had on Jewish life is very important to understand the Jewish community and Jewish philosophy. So that's why we need the real history. We have to find out what really happened. Now, for decades, Sherwin Wine taught a class at the Birmingham Temple, which he founded, called The Real History of the Jews. Now, it's a bit chutzpahdik, or as I heard um, Al Gore say once, chutzpahdik, um, <laughs> to say that this is the real history, as if all the other histories are wrong, false, whatever. Uh, but in this case, he combined his tremendous depth of knowledge in Jewish history, his voracious reading, with brilliant personal insight, an imitable wit, and he taught them to the best of his knowledge what he knew happened in Jewish history. Now, I was one of his students from youngest ages all the way through rabbinical school. So after he died, I took on this project of putting the book together. And if it takes chutzpah to write a book like this, it takes even more chutzpah to edit a book someone else has written like this, particularly when he's not around to argue with anyone. Um, so I, I did my best. But I want to share with you some of the strengths of Sherman Wine as a teacher, which are also strengths in the book. So as one example, he had a tremendous knowledge and erudition in world history and culture, not only in Jewish culture. So he was able to draw fascinating parallels between Jewish life and non-Jewish life. So in one passage, he compares the Pharisees of the first century BCE to the Calvinists of the 17th and 18th century. How, how, what are the similarities? Well, they were both contemptuous of the old religious establishment hostile to the old aristocracy, populist in their insistence on turning lay people into priests, bourgeois in their class resistance and ambitions for power, conformist in their love of surveillance, self-righteous in their dismissal of the opinions of their opponents, fervent in their articulation of judgment day, reward, and punishment, and ardent in their obedience to their own newly created clergy. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever compared Pharisees and Calvinists <laughs> But those seem to be a lot of striking similarities between the two, that maybe there's something to it that they're both responses to the human condition, and so it's not unexpected that they might respond in a fanatical way that reflects each other. He sets the context in world history for what happens in Jewish life. So in another section, I won't read, he describes the variety of Jewish, uh, of, sorry, a variety of Christian heresies that developed, the Arian heresy and the Monophysite heresy, 
And what he explores is not just the development of those ideas, but even more importantly, how they related to what was happening to the Jews living under those different heresies, how it related to uh, Jewish development. And uh, often in Jewish life, you get the idea that you're living in a bubble, and what's happening outside doesn't affect you at all. But in fact, it has a big impact because the ideas surrounding you affect what you are doing. As one example, you may be familiar with a, a prayer called the Kaddish, which is a prayer for the dead, although it actually is part of the regular service. It's not only a prayer for the dead. Um, but the idea of reciting this particular prayer as a way to uh, help your loved ones make progress after they've died toward a fair judgment um, appears in Jewish thought around the same time that in Catholic thought, the idea that you could either buy indulgences or say, say prayers and it will help your relatives get out of purgatory shows up. And so there's obviously, obviously some interchange and dialogue between the two groups, but if you don't know anything about church history, you're not going to get the evolution of that idea in Jewish life, and that's what's a real strength in this book, is presenting the context for what happened. Now another strength is that he has a marvelous ability to synthesize vast amounts of information in very clear systems. So one example, he notes that Jews living in multilingual settings will often choose the language of the dominant power. So when they moved to Montreal, they spoke English and not French. When they were living in Prague, they didn't speak Czech. They spoke German, which was the Austro-Hungarian Empire's language. When they were living in North Africa, they didn't speak Berber, they spoke French, which was the colonial power at the time. Uh, so that's, again, from a wide range of times and places, but a very similar phenomenon. Or another example, there's a claim that's often made in traditional Jewish life that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you do what you're supposed to. Follow all the rules, the dietary laws, recite the prayers even if you don't believe them, but just do what you're supposed to do. And Wine points out that this idea that there is no belief system is ridiculous. It's a section he calls Rabbinic Creed. At the heart of the Rabbinic Prayer Service was the Rabbinic Creed. The assertion that Orthodox Judaism had no creed is false. Both the Shema, that uh, sort of cardinal line of faith, and the Amidah, the standing prayer, the core elements of the morning and afternoon prayers, since the evening prayers have only the Amidah, presents a creedal statement disguised as praise. The first two blessings of the Amidah are from the doctrines of inherited merit and the resurrection of the dead. Blessed are you, Lord our God, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Blessed are you, Lord our God, who revives the dead. So he's blessing God for doing things. That's a claim that God does those things. It's a statement of belief. And the remaining blessings conclude in a similar way with affirmations about the nature of God. He listens to prayer. He will bring his Messiah. He will restore the temple. If the recitation of these words was not required as an act of public conformity, then they would not be a creed. But they are. And so they are. And he also has a marvelous sense of humor. So I want to give you just two examples of that. One is on uh, his discussion of Spinoza and Spinoza's philosophy. He points out that um, the God of the Enlightenment uh, could find different forms that all tended to a similar result. Spinoza's pantheism was one of two attempts to make God compatible with the scientific age. The other was deism. Most Enlightenment philosophers were deists, as was Thomas Jefferson. Deists maintained that God created the world and established the laws of nature which governed it. Having done so, he retired, a deity emeritus, and is unavailable to intervene to change anything that the order of the universe arranges. Prayer is useless. Talking to God is like talking to the wall. The behavioral consequences of deism, pantheism, and atheism are all the same. Now, I had never heard of this God of enlightenment referred to as a deity emeritus. <laughs> But it's a wonderful comparison. You know, he's not in the office very much, he doesn't answer his phone calls, he doesn't really have a lot of responsibilities. No, but he gets credit for the work that he did in the past. So that's the, uh, the deity of Eric. Now another example of his humor. He's describing the conflict that uh, Eastern Jews had living under uh, Persian culture. Most cultures feature either burial or cremation. But Persian culture, like Tibetan culture, ultimately preferred exposure to vultures. Bodies were simply left to be eaten in sacred places frequented by hungry birds of prey. The reason for this choice is lost in dim antiquity, but the Zoroastrian priests of the Persians offered a religious justification. They claimed that earth and fire were sacred and must not be defiled by the dead. Traditional Jews have a hard time dealing with cremation. You can just imagine how they must have responded to vultures. <laughs> imagine you're putting your, 
your relative out there for the vultures, uh, it doesn't seem very respectful. So you can imagine a cultural conflict between those two styles of burial. Now, Sherwin himself described his project in the introduction to the book. The origins of the Jewish people, the origins of the, of the Bible, the evolution of priestly Judaism, all these important chapters in Jewish history that have been distorted by mythology and apologetics have alternate stories. The new alternatives are less romantic because the gods have been reduced to ideas in human minds. But in other ways, the new stories are more interesting and exciting because they are not merely the repetition of familiar religious doctrine. Flesh and blood people of the narrative are no longer the passive victims of divine manipulation, but rather the authors and the creators of the events themselves. So now you get a natural history, a secular history, a human history of how these people really came to be, how they came to write the books that we now read as the Bible or, or rabbinic literature. So a couple examples of lessons from the book, and then I want to open up for comments, questions, uh, anything like that. The first point is that what's Jewish about Judaism is the Jews. It's not that it came from Sinai, that, not that it has a core set of beliefs. If you compare the animal sacrifice of the temple in Jerusalem, the polytheism in the first temple period that was demonstrated in the Book of Kings, there's a lot of evidence for that, the neo-Hellenistic Aristotelian philosophy of Maimonides in the Middle Ages, the Jewish mystical school of Kabbalah, whether it's medieval Kabbalah or Madonna's neo-Kabbalah, <laughs> the Enlightenment inflected rationalism of 19th century Reform Judaism and secular Judaism in the 20th century. They don't have theology in common. They don't have ritual practice in common. They don't have dietary laws in common, liturgy, lifestyle. The Jews have been everything from farmers and shepherds to warriors and priests to merchants, urban intellectuals, to dot-com innovators. The answer is that there's nothing that ties them all together other than their connection as a people. So Judaism isn't even primarily a religion. It was a people that developed many religious cultures over the course of their evolution. What they all have in common is their creation by the Jewish people. It did not appear from above and beyond. Judaism came from the Jewish people and thus should serve our needs and be open to change even today. In fact, it's always evolved in response to the outside world, so change is a Jewish tradition. Now, there's also new questions that we ask and we answer in a secular history of the Jews. For example, when deciding what books would be in the Bible, which were put in and which were left out. And not simply for theological reasons, there may have been political advantages to putting in some or leaving out others. As one example, the books of Maccabees were not included. And it was many years later that the rabbis decided to include something a little bit about Hanukkah because evidently the people kept doing it, and they had to come up with some other reason for it. The Maccabees books, as I mentioned, had no miracle of the oil. Josephus, 100 years after the Maccabees, has no miracle of the oil. It's only in the Talmud, which is a collection of Jewish wisdom most likely compiled around the year 500 BCE, I'm sorry, 500 CE, 500 of the Common Era, that this story first appears. It doesn't even appear in a book called the Mishnah that was put together around 200. So the rabbis hadn't even invented the story until 500 or 400 of the Common Era. And what is their story? They don't give it a whole section to focus on. They have a little splurge in the section on Shabbat candles and a little splurge in the section on saying blessings, and that's it. And what they say is, when the Maccabees reconquered the temple, they found only enough oil to last for one day, and they lit the lamp, and miraculously, it lasted for eight days. This is the miracle of the light story that you hear. Well, again, this is invented many centuries after the Maccabees. So what political purpose does that serve? Well, the rabbis didn't like the Maccabees. Because the Maccabees began as a pietist rebellion. Remember, they're fighting the Hellenized Jews. They are the traditionalists. But after a couple generations, their early names were good Jewish names like Yehuda, Judah, and Matatiahu, Mattathias. And then they take names like Hyrcanos, and Alexander, and Aristobulus. <laughs> and you can see they've become Hellenized over time, such that they begin, in fact, to call themselves king, when you should only be a king from the house of King David, and they are not. So the rabbis decided they don't like the Maccabees at all because of their portrayal of the pietist perspective, because of their Hellenization. So they don't include the books of Maccabees in the Bible as they put it together. And they minimize the Maccabees by making Hanukkah about God and not about the people. You see, that miracle of the light story makes it about the miracle and not about the reconquest, not about the establishment of a state, which for the Maccabees was the point of the holiday. So that's how it changes over time, how the interpretation makes a difference. And how asking secular questions changes the story. You look for human motivations and natural causes for historical processes. You know, you read the book of the prophets in the Bible, they have a theory of history. 
Their theory of history is the Jews do well when they follow God and the Jews do poorly when they don't obey God. Jimmy Carter, by the way, had the same theory. If you read his book, uh, Peace Not Apartheid, um, he talks about meeting with Golda Meir, who was a very, very secular Prime Minister of Israel, and um, he says to her, you know, part of the problem is that you've strayed from God too much. And she said, well, we have Orthodox parties in our coalition, I'll let them handle that department. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, the point is that that idea comes from the province, but is carried through in evangelical Christianity as well, that history of the Jews is a function of their obedience to God. But a secular history doesn't believe that. It's based on human beings. And after all, I don't buy what the prophets say because, again, their lifestyle, their worldview is so radically removed from our own that while they say something's relevant to us, a lot of what they say is irrelevant or even obnoxious to our perspective. The idea that you would blame a people for being destroyed because of their sins and add guilt to their suffering, from our perspective, is blaming the victim. We wouldn't do that. But you do hear that, by the way, whenever there's a hurricane, you have the predictable people who show up and say, it must be a punishment for sins which I define as the things I don't like. So if there's an earthquake or a tornado or a drought in a religious community, it's obviously not a judgment because I like those people. But when there's a hurricane in New York City or New Orleans, well then it must be, it must be a judgment. Okay, so you see how a secular history is gonna take it more reasonably. Um, you know, as one example, the vast majority of Jews in the world today have been tremendously secularized. What percent of Jews would you guess keep kosher? 15%, 15%, 15 maybe 20% depending on the community. What percent of Jews like Hanukkah candles? Well, that's closer to 80%, 85%. Not 100%, but much higher. It's a once in a while thing, and it's around Christmas time, so it has communal reinforcement. But if you went back 400 years, those numbers would be very different. You know, 400 years ago, how many Jews were not Orthodox? Maybe Spinoza and his friend. And then, <laughs> so, so all, you know, 100% minus one. Uh, but today, the vast majority of Jews live moderately secularized lives. Even ones who are uh, reform or conservative Jews who wouldn't call themselves secular have clearly been secularized. But after all, that's happened to the world around us as well. Look at church attendance rates. If you went back 200 years, what percent of people went to church every Sunday versus now? Or even more recently, we've seen the rise of people who call themselves none of the above, which doesn't mean that they're atheists necessarily, but it does mean that they're not attached to a church institution. Even that is a kind of secularish or secularizing process. After all, it was easy to believe the Bible was true Jewish history when everyone else believed the Bible was true Jewish history around you. Now Spinoza may have started the ball rolling on modern biblical criticism because he speculated that Moses in fact did not write the Torah given the fact that at the end of Deuteronomy it describes Moses' death and what happens afterwards. It also points out at a different point in the Bible that Moses was the most humble prophet who ever lived. Now it's unlikely that the person who is the most humble prophet who ever lived would write that he was the most humble prophet who ever lived. <laughs> And there were other anachronisms and things that we found later, but the idea that Moses wasn't the author opened up who was the author, when was it written, and so on. And Spinoza speculated it was written much, much later than it was claimed. That's the beginning of modern biblical criticism to find out who really wrote the Bible and why. It wasn't carried on by the Jews. It was carried on actually by Protestant theologians in the 18th and 19th centuries that developed what we call today the documentary hypothesis. But in the end, it became uh, deeply rooted in our understanding of Jewish history. Uh, even though it wasn't done by the Jews. That's again why you need to learn from all sources to find out the real history of the past. So in this book you'll find attention to secular Jews as well. The Jewish involvement in the socialist movement, in the labor movement. The anti-traditionalism of the Zionist movement where they said we're not going to wait for a Messiah to take us, we're going to go ourselves and we're going to build a new Jewish culture that is not religious, that is not pious, but is creative and self-assertive. You have the acculturation to our surrounding society presented in a positive way, not as a negative disaster. The contribution of Jews to world culture, not only to Jewish life, including perhaps being a model for, mobiliz uh, for globalization. You see, the Jewish experience may well be the future for most of the world. In feudal Europe, the Jews tended to live a commercial lifestyle. They were not allowed to own land, so they couldn't be landowners. And they were also not interested in being serfs, because honestly, who wants to volunteer to be a peasant? Mm -hmm. Nobody. So instead, they lived in this middle ground of living in towns and cities, much more than the general population. They were much more urbanized. And they lived a commercial lifestyle. 
They were in crafts and trade. They were merchants. Occasionally, believe it or not, they were tavern owners. They would buy the right to be able to make liquor in a particular area from the landowner, and they would take the grain, convert it into, into alcohol, and then sell it back to the population. Uh, sometimes they even did a job called tax farming, where they would buy the right to collect taxes in a particular area, and of course nobody likes the tax person. Uh, led to the association again of Jews with money from a peasant mentality where money was evil, uh, but it was a way of making a living. And they lived in this commercial world in feudal Europe when that was not respected. Come the 18th and 19th century, the beginning of what used to be called liberal economics or free market economics, now the Jews are very well positioned to move forward in the commercial economy, but also their experience of being a diaspora population among a rooted population, maybe the only one in the future. Think about American colonies in Shanghai and Hong Kong, or even in this, in this country, people who move from one place to another but still root for their hometown teams or feel connected to where they come from. Well, that's the model that Jewish life has experienced for many centuries. Very early in their history, the Jews tasted the possibility of becoming a world people. This development may be their most enduring contribution to the world. Many historians will still maintain that monotheism and a compassionate ethics were the major contributions of the Jews. But monotheism is an increasingly problematic ideology in a secular world. And philosophic monotheism has its roots in many cultures. As for compassionate ethics, it is neither ethical nor empirically responsible for any nation to designate, designate itself as the inventor of ethics. Given their history and influence, the Jews have been and remain a provocative and extraordinary people, the unwitting precursors of a global world that they helped to invent. Living as an American in China is a, was, was uh, prefigured by living as a Jew in Spain or in Poland or in other places where your identity was distinct from the people among whom you lived. Another lesson that's very important. The greatest time in Jewish history is now. Sherwin has no nostalgia for the glory days of Abraham or the wisdom of Solomon. I had a professor in high school whenever he was asked when, what period he would like to live, he was a professor of history. Whenever he was asked in what period he would like to live, he always said, right now, because of the dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> and the sanitation. And the immunization. And, I mean, keep in mind that two-thirds of this room would not be here if I were giving this lecture 400 years ago. So sometimes you have to admit the greatest time is now, not the golden days of medieval Spain or wherever else. The greatest time is now. Despite the Holocaust, never before have the Jews, both individually and collectively, possessed more wealth, more power, and more influence. We don't talk about it a lot because of anti-Semitic implications. That it's sinister, but it may be true. The global economy, which the Jews helped to pioneer, now embraces the planet. The realm of science, in which Jews have excelled far beyond their numbers, has now replaced religious faith as the dominant source of intellectual power in the countries that possess military and economic strength. The legacy of Jewish Nobel Prize winners outshines the prophets and sages of the religious past. It is science that now has the power to transform human existence. None of the insights of the biblical past have cured disease, lengthened life, triggered a dynamic economy, or forged the technology to unite humanity. In fact, the hardcore of religious fundamentalists who hate the modern world and the world of science derive their inspiration from the wisdom of that era. The emerging global culture, which rests on the achievements of science, has dramatically raised the standard of living for over one half of the people on our planet. Most of the readers of this book would not have been alive to read any book without the successes and special contributions of Jewish medical scientists. And he gives them a lot more credit than the problems of the Bible. And the last point to make is that for Sherman Wine and for a humanistic Jew, studying Jewish history is Jewish practice. You don't only connect to being Jewish by reciting prayers or uh, studying the Torah text. You can learn where our people came from and how they developed, how they came to be who they are today, whom they may become in the future. That's what studying Jewish history is about, and that is a deep and meaningful Jewish practice. The meaning of the Jewish experience is the subject of this book, but also the concern of humanistic Judaism as well. Now, Sherwin Wine did not invent the facts of Jewish history. He read them, he synthesized them, he understood that the sweep of the Jewish experience has lessons to be drawn from it. Lessons about what happened and why, lessons about what may yet happen, and what we can do with that knowledge going forward. His last gift is the sharing of knowledge. For all of his creativity, his independent thinking, his activism, his creating organizations, Sherwin was a consummate rabbi. And if rabbi means teacher, then that work as a teacher continues. So, 
I'm happy to answer any questions you have either about humanistic Judaism in general or specifically about Jewish history or about this book in particular. But again, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here. Jewish culture to come from being Canaanite to being Jewish. What what caused what it was, a, thir it was a Thursday? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How that I mean I'm not going to do that. I'll give you a window. Okay. <laughs> okay. So one of the questions is always where does Jewish history begin? What's the starting point? Uh -huh. um, and it's complicated because the Exodus is very problematic. Mm -hmm. There's a very vague reference to a destruction of a people called Isser, which could be short for Israel. Um, in a steely uh, monument that's uh, dated to around 1200 BCE. So maybe there was something there, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to have the Exodus and Conquest story true as described in the Bible because at that time, the uh, Egyptians were fully in control of the area and it wouldn't have made sense to have a this massive conquest then. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for the judges period, for example. Although certainly some cities were conquered. The city of Jericho, which is a you know, very famous story, you know, they blew the trumpets, the walls came tumbling down, you know, the song anyways. <laughs> now, the problem is that at the time that Jericho supposedly happened, it was deserted. It was settled 300 years before, it was settled 200 years after, but that window of the conquest, it was abandoned. And there isn't a uniform layer of burning in the settlements at that time period either. So it suggests the conquest narrative is off too. So now you get to David and Solomon. There have recently been some excavations of what looked like monumental size architecture dated to around the time King David supposedly lived. Now, again, the sensationalists will say it's King David's palace, but it doesn't have his, you know, nameplate on the bed or anything. You know, there's no indication that it was him. We do have a reference to a house of David from a couple hundred years later. There's a fragment of pottery that has some writing on it that refers to a Beit David, a house of David. Now, it is plausible that if a couple hundred years later they're referring to a house of David, that at one time, sometime before then, there was, in fact, a David who could have been a king. Now, whether he was good with a slingshot, whether he was good at playing the harp, whether he could write a psalm or not, we don't know. Uh, but there is an indication there could have at least been a David. Now, whether there was a United Kingdom, as the Bible describes, we don't know. Whether there were um, the battles between the north and the south, the building of the golden calves, the Jeroboam, the, we don't know all those details because we haven't found them. But we can see through the narrative in the book of Kings that there's this battling between Israelite culture and Canaanite culture as if they're cousins. So for example, one of the northern kings, Ahab, marries Jezebel, who was a Canaanite pre, uh, um, princess. And she brings into Israel her worship system. But it's not that foreign because it's an allied language. Canaanite language and Hebrew language are very, very similar. In fact, the name of the Hebrew god, yod heh vav -Hey, pronounced Adonai in traditional circles, but most likely pronounced as Yahweh, also sometimes comes out as Jehovah, depending on who's uh, doing the telling. Um, that is one of the Canaanite pantheon of gods. There's El, who is the sky god, like Elohim, which is another name for God in Hebrew. There's El, the sky god, and then he has his consort, Asherah, and then you have Yahweh, and you have Baal, and you have Anat, um, sort of the next generation down, and of course Baal and Yahweh are battling over Anat, and that's you know, the classic rivalry in, in mythology. Um, but he's clearly a god among gods. And so this is why you can see in some of the uh, narratives in the Bible that there is this relic of a polytheistic past. Um, in the story of Noah, the sons of God come down and have relations with the daughters of men. Um, in the Ten Commandments, it says, you will have no other gods before me. You can have them behind me or after me, but not before me. Uh, there's uh, the idea of, uh, in the uh, Song of the Sea, after the Pharaoh's chariots are crushed by the Red Sea, uh, Miriam sings, who is like you among the gods? Who's like you among, it's often translated as among the mighty, because they don't want to say the gods, but really in Hebrew it says the gods. So again, you get the sense of Yahweh as being elevated in importance. That's part of this differentiation process where now he becomes the Hebrew god, Baal becomes the Canaanite god, and they're beginning to segregate. In the end, it was most, I'm sorry, in the end it was most likely a splitting of one culture into two, where you've had the coastal cities that became identified as Canaanite or Phoenician was the Greek term, and the hill country became identified with the Hebrew peoples. Um, and that most likely took place between, say, 1000 and 700 uh, BCE. By the time of around 800 BCE, we begin to get a lot more confirmation of what the Bible describes. So a king named Yehu is described in the Bible, and we actually have a picture of him in the Assyrian records 
where he's bowing down, paying tribute to the Assyrian king, and it says, Yahu of Beit Omri, um, which means uh, Yehu from the house of Omri, who was the founding king of the northern kingdom, was like the house of David, was for Judah. So that's confirmation of a biblical piece. We have a description of a tunnel digging during the siege of Jerusalem, and we found that tunnel and a, uh, a plaque in the tunnel that describes how it was made, very similar to how it was made in the Bible. You have a burning layer at that date that confirms the biblical narrative with the king around the same time. So you begin to see that there's a lot more confirmation by 700 BCE. Again, where does it start? It's sometime in that fuzzy period, which is 1,000 AD. Long answer to a short question. Oh, that's exactly okay. Yes, please. A uh, couple of things. First, you know, on, the, on, on Egypt, they, um, those Egyptian scribes were very, very busy people. They could prep of every commercial transaction, the salary of every soldier, but supposedly, according to some versions, <coughs> up to 300,000 Israelites uh, that, that, that went uh, with Moses. And uh, you think that those scribes would have done a little bit more about the loss of their whole workforce? Well, uh, well, exactly. I mean, actually, the, the Bible mm -hmm. narrative describes 600,000 men. Mm -hmm. If you add women and children in there, the estimates are around 2 million. But again, it's legend. It's not what actually happened. Yeah. You can dig through the Sinai Desert. They didn't break a pot. They didn't make an outhouse. <laughs> I mean, you'd think there'd be some kind of evidence. Uh, but this is, this is, again, the function of legendary history. Now, there may have been some of the Hebrew people who experienced the slavery in Egypt. But if it were 60 people that left, it's not a, it's not a valuable story. If it's 600,000 people, now it becomes an epic saga. Um, and so that's why we have to, again, take the, um, the stories with a grain of salt without evidence to support it. The other thought behind the uh, story of the exodus from Egypt is it has two positive functions. One is, it may have been the hill country feeling an exodus from the Canaanite cities, that is getting their independence from these urban elites. Uh, by the way, settling, uh, uh, eating pigs is one of those examples of the differentiation, where you have a settled agriculture in a city that can support pigs, but if you're a shepherd in the hillside, you're not gonna eat pigs, and that's what the other people eat, so that's why that dietary law comes into place. And so an Exodus story could have a mythological function like that, but it also gives the Jews roots in one of the two major cradles of civilization. Do you remember where Abraham comes from? He comes from Ur, which is in Babylonia, one of the oldest cradles of civilization. Not Babylonia, and, it's modern Basra. Well, it's modern day Iraq. It was uh, in Sumeria, further south. And then he travels up two uh, cities through what is today Iraq and then comes back down into the land of Israel. What happens, of course, is that gives the Jews mythological roots in both Mesopotamia and in Egypt with those two stories. And now they are in between the two, but have roots in both places. So again, it's the function of mythology, just like the Adam and Eve story. It's not history. It's a myth, and it's trying to explain something. So it may be that a lot of these myths of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are origin stories for the Hebrew people, and not just origin stories for why they eat certain things or uh, where the humanity came from in the case of Adam and Eve. Uh, it's back there. Uh, one of the things we need to remember when we start reading histories and so forth is that it's written by the winners of any conflict, and anything that's written by a theologian is to, per to preserve his position and the gratuities he gets from the population for, for maintaining his position. Unlike a politician. <laughs> what do you do first? <laughs> uh, and so, as you go back, my degree is not apology, by the way. When, as you go back through this and start reading and listening to it, uh, I don't think a grain of salt is enough. I think sometimes you need a whole salt shaker. <laughs> because what's written down and what evidence proves or disproves it uh, is I'm not even close. I mean, we're talking about miles apart. Okay? Sure. Uh, well, you have to understand, I'm coming at this as a humanistic rabbi, not a traditional yeah. rabbi, which means that we use biblical archaeology, the forefront of, I mean, think about Israel Finkelstein's The Bible on Earth, or even more recent works. That's what informs this book and what informs our approach to this history. We don't buy the Bible story just because it's in the Bible. The challenge is that occasionally the Bible story is confirmed right. oh, by yeah. archaeological evidence. And so you can't be willfully in denial that anything in the Bible could even possibly be true. So here's an example I often use. You could theoretically learn something about the Democratic Party from the Republican Party's website. <laughs> yeah. It would not be necessarily accurate. There'd be a lot of spin to it. You'd have, you know, you have to filter through the interpretive lens there. Um, but there is some, so the same thing is true when describing the history of Israelite polytheism. 
there's a lot of condemnation of it in the Torah text and also in the narratives in the Book of Kings where they clean out the temple and clean out the temple. They have to clean out the temple so many times, which you can read between the lines, is the people wanted to keep putting it back in there. In fact, there's a narrative in the Book of Jeremiah, which happens after the temple's been destroyed, where the women of Jerusalem come to Jeremiah and they say, you idiot, you can't just get rid of all that goddess worship in the temple and look what she did to us. She destroyed the city. And so we're going to go worship the Queen of Heaven because we don't want to listen to you anymore. And he says, well, no, it's because you worship the Queen that Yahweh destroyed you. So you, you could argue it both ways. We only have the Yahweh side of the story. I've, I've always felt that if God created man, man being a gentleman, we turn to compliment. Yes, <laughs> a conversation uh, online just recently with a, uh, a right wing Christian guy who was claiming that uh, the uh, Hebrew text and history coincide with, um, I believe he said, uh, Greek uh, text and history uh, around the time of Jesus that confirmed Jesus' existence and the crucifixion and all that sort of thing. I've, I've never heard anybody make that claim before. Well, what happened in the Middle Ages, the, I mentioned the historian Josephus. Uh, Josephus lived in the first century of the Common Era, uh, which is around the same time that Jesus did. So he lived somewhat later, um, but in the same ballpark. Certainly the same time as the early Christians. And Josephus wrote a number of very important books. He wrote uh, a history of the great war of revolt against the Romans that took place in around the year 70 of the Common Era. He was actually a general in that war. He surrendered his army and then turned sides to the Roman side, so the Jews didn't like him so much. But he wrote a history of that war that tried to exonerate the Jews. And he also wrote a history of Jewish history called The Antiquities of the Jews. He wrote a book against an anti-Semitic book that was written by a Greek in Alexandria named um, uh, Apion. And so he wrote a book called Against Apion. We don't have Apion's book anymore, but we have his rebuttals against Apion. <laughs> um, and he wrote his own autobiography near the end of his life. So what happened with Josephus was in the Middle Ages, a line got inserted into the text that says something like, and there was a group called the Christians, and there was a, name, a man named Jesus, and he was the Christ. No, further, in the middle no further comment than that. And it seems very unlike anything that Josephus would have said, given that he wasn't Christian or had nothing to do with it. So mm -hmm. it was most likely an insertion that was added. But it was used to claim that even Josephus testifies to the, the antiquity of Jesus, because it was embarrassing that he didn't until the, the emendation was made. Um, so that might be what he's thinking of. Um, look, I, I have no difficulty believing that there was a Jesus. In fact, there were Jesuses of modification of the name Joshua in Hebrew. Yeshu is what is translated as Jesus, but that's just a short form for Yeshua. So think of Josh, Joshua, this is another form of it. Um, so the belief that there was a Jesus or that people thought he was a Messiah wasn't unusual either. There were other Messiahs that were claimed at the time. Had been for who, several years. So yeah, who, years were, who were likewise failures. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the uh, difference was that in this case, his followers came up with a way for him to live on, at least in their minds, right? So um, the, the fact that the there, there could have been a Jesus is certainly possible. Um, that he could have been crucified as a messiah is certainly possible. That he rose three days later and asked for some food is, I would say, less likely. <laughs> 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 it's a big <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, on a more practical note, uh, if you are an humanist uh, rabbi or Jew, mm -hmm. what do you say in terms of circumcision? Can you be one with a circumcised? Well, one word for an uncircumcised Jew is a woman. <laughs> that is, that is they're, they're not circumcised and they're fully Jewish. In fact, they make other Jews. So, <laughs> so it's not the only way to be Jewish. I mean, the other point is that um, traditionally what makes you Jewish, in the, even the Orthodox definition, is if your mother is Jewish, if you're born Jewish. Not what you do, not what you eat, not what you say, not what you believe. That's again a claim that Judaism is an, is an ethnic identity as much as a religious and cultural connection too. Now, I will say that the vast majority of Jews do choose to circumcise their children. Uh, my approach is it's up to the parents to make the choice. Uh, it doesn't determine whether the, the child connects with Jewish history, culture, family, and all that. That's a function of their lived life, not what they look like. Um, and in the end, it's up to the parents to make that choice. Um, you know, right now, the American Pediatric, Pediatric Association has a 
very mildly positive recommendation for it, that the benefits slightly outweigh the risk of complication. Uh, but in the end, my approach is it's up to parents to make that choice, and different parents will make a different choice. But my job is to affirm their connection to the Jewish people, whether or not they choose to do it, or if they choose to do it in a hospital as opposed to having a ritual ceremony. Um, in the end, uh, I'm thrilled to be able to welcome a child into the Jewish family, even from one non-Jewish parent and one Jewish parent. I don't care which parent is the Jewish parent, because again, for us, being Jewish is a family identity, and you can live in more than one family at a time uh, and feel connected to both cultures. Yes, please. You just mentioned that implying that the maternal, you know, being a Jew descending from your mother, that negates the Karaites who believe that it's, a, it's through the father's line, not the mother's line. The Karaites? Yeah. Well, the Karaites is a sect that evolved around the ninth century of the common era. It was in response to a battle for succession over who was going to control the Jewish community of Baghdad and by extension the Eastern Diaspora. And uh, they decided they wanted to reject rabbinic tradition, reject the Talmud, and go back to just the Bible. When you go back to just the Bible, there's nothing in the Bible that clearly indicates that the mother defines being Jewish. In fact, there are plenty of stories of Jewish men marrying non-Jewish women. The story of Judah and Tamar, the story of Moses and his Cushite wife, Abraham marries someone that isn't Jewish. And Joseph marries the daughter of an Egyptian priest. Now, in rabbinic commentary, they explain that actually that daughter of an Egyptian priest was, um, if you remember the story of Dina, who is Joseph's sister, half-sister, she gets raped by a Canaanite prince, and then she vanishes from the story. But in the rabbinic version, she in fact had a daughter who was then given up for adoption with a special amulet with the word in Hebrew on it, and then that daughter was adopted by someone in Egypt who became an Egyptian priest, and then when she was going to get married, Joseph saw her and saw that little Hebrew amulet on her, and so he knew that she was okay to bring to marry. So in fact, he didn't marry someone who wasn't Jewish. This is like soap opera, right? <laughs> um, so that was the rabbinic way to get around the fact that in the Bible it clearly said that he married someone that wasn't Jewish, and yet his children were Jewish. So that's one of the reasons why the Karaite model may have uh, held that the father was determinative because they're going back to the Bible in its original form. Um, the challenge is that the Karaites and the, and the Rabbinites, or the Karaites and mainstream rabbinic Judaism, split off somewhat after this time. For a time, they would intermarry with each other. There are even examples of ketubahs or marriage agreements between families of the two if, if their kids were marrying each other, specifying that they had the rights to their own particular practices in the home. Um, but by the, I don't know, by the 1400s, 1500s, they really had become totally separate communities. Um, and the Karaites themselves, generally didn't identify with the Jews. There was, in fact, a Karaite community in Lithuania during the Second World War. And when the Nazis came in, both the Jews and the Karaites said, we're not Jews, they're not Jews, the Karaites aren't Jews. And so they were not killed by the Nazis in that uh, invasion, because at that point, the communities had separated enough that what's they were different. What's the name of that group? Oh, the Karaites. Maybe the reason that they say that it's a woman, it's the woman, it comes from a woman, it's because they always know who the mother is. Well, that was a theory, right? I mean, today we, can, we have genetics and a lot of other resources. Um, but again, it, it provides an ethnic definition um, in a way that uh, is not simply a set of beliefs, like a Christianity or Islam, where belief is a very important piece of, uh, of identifying with the tradition. Yes, please. Yeah, um, what you said about the split off between the coast and the hills, which is a very traditional split, which you see in many different cultures. So are you implying or saying that Judaism arose from this cultural split, and then on the coastal side, we had the Phoenicians who became today's Palestinians? No. <laughs> no. No, the Phoenicians, um, I mean, they, they became the people of the land, but they went through many evolutions. Okay. By, the, by the time of the Greco-Roman period, they might not have even called themselves Canaanites. Uh, I mean, the late Greco-Roman period, um, the idea of, uh, I mean, look, the Palestinians are mostly Arab, and the Arabs mostly come from a place called Arabia. They aren't Canaanites. They're okay, from for the Arabs themselves. Don't see the Palestinians as, as Arabs. Palestinians. Or, no, they do. no the, Arab, the Palestinians themselves, yeah. they're like Iranians. No, no, no. No, in no. terms of them denying no, no. being yeah. Arabs. No, no, no. Yeah. No, you're yeah. wrong. Yes, yes, yeah. No, no, no. The Palestinians, the Palestinians yeah. consider themselves to be part of the broader Arab Politically, uh, world. Not culturally. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, uh, no, I, <clears> I've never heard <throat> that. Uh, I think that the challenge, the challenge that comes in is in the competition for history in a political sense. That is, there are times that Palestinians have rejected Jewish history and its claims to the land, including the, the West, Western Wall in Jerusalem. And there are times that the Israelis have tried to minimize Palestinian claims to the land, or either one has claimed too far back. So 
uh, you get some of the more religious right in Israel to say, well, Abraham bought a cave in Hebron, and that's why we own it, because it says so in the Bible, that the Bible doesn't count as a deed of sale. Um, but you also get Palestinians who claim to be the Canaanites, so that they can claim to be going back a long ways, but it's not really supported by uh, archaeological evidence, cultural evidence, genetic evidence. It just doesn't uh, bear the weight of uh, academic history. It's a political claim, but again, if you can undermine the Jewish claim to the land, then you can buttress your claim to being there. If you can claim the Jews were uh, outside settlers brought in by the Assyrians even back in the 7th century BCE, then it's just them doing the same thing all over again. That's a political argument. So what's but the you have to try what? Well, what are the latest genetic findings? You mentioned that previously. Well, again, the uh, Palestinian population, like the Israeli population, as far as I recall, um, are consistent with the general Semitic profile of the Middle East. You know, they're not uh, from outside or beyond. So they're not from Iran, for example. That's a Persian people, which is an Indo-European people, speaking Indo-European language. But the Palestinians have spoken Arabic for as long as there have been that. And, and even the concept of a Palestinian national identity is relatively recent, because it was a much larger province of Syria-Palestine, included the East Bank, it included Syria itself and Lebanon. Those are all lines that were divided by Western powers after the First World War that created these national identities. But in the end, in the Ottoman Empire, it was a very different sense of who they were and what they were. People in the Galilee in the north felt very different from people in Gaza in the south because they were a long ways apart in a pre-modern period where travel was by donkey. And you know, you can imagine someone who is, you know, a month's travel away is going to feel very different from you. Now today, no one is a month's travel away, but people who are, you know, multiple hours on a plane away, you can imagine, will be very culturally different. We'll translate that into months of months of geography. But the, look, the Israeli national identity is a recent invention too. You know, it's only about maybe 100 years old in theory and 70 years old in practice. But just because it's new doesn't mean it's not valid. And the same thing is true for Palestinian national identity. So. How about the Samaritans? The Samaritans. OK. This is also talked about in the book. I don't want to give all the answers away. Uh, <laughs> but the Samaritans were, were most likely split off from around the time of the destruction of the first temple and what was called the exile to Babylonia. The elites of Jerusalem were taken to Babylonia, but the peasants were sort of left on the land. And uh, when the elites came back about 100 years later, they wanted to get control, basically, over the people who had been there. And so they claimed that the people who had been there had married local women and not Jewish women, and therefore they had to be kicked out. This is described in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the uh, ne later end of the uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, so the Samaritans were formed out of that split by the people who refused to divorce their foreign wives, or so-called foreign wives. Uh, they wound up creating their own sanctuary in a place called Shomron, which was also known as Samaria in the north of Israel. They had their own Torah scroll, but it actually had six books. It includes Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Genesis, of course, and Joshua at the end, uh, whereas the traditional Jewish Torah only has the first five books. Um, and the reason they did that was Joshua has them conquer the land. They're already in the land, as opposed to waiting to come in, like the exiles are waiting to come back. Um, at the same time, they changed the text in the uh, blessings and curses part of Deuteronomy where it says the northern mountain will be cursed and the southern mountain will be blessed they flipped it. So for the Samaritans the northern mountain is blessed and the southern mountain is cursed. Mm. Now which is the original correct version? Given that there are 5,000 Samaritans and 15 million Jews, the Jews win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we may not really know what the original version was but the Samaritans still exist in a very small number. Their shrine is uh, near what is today Nablus in the West Bank. And by the way, they still do the Passover sacrifice of a lamb and roast it all night as is prescribed in the Bible. They still do that actively. So uh, if you have a chance to see a video of that and you want to see what that good old time religion really looked like, you can see it in all of its bloody glory. Yeah, like yes, please. <laughs> Not like that. Yes. Well, can we shoot up to the present for a moment? Sure. Uh, as weird as it seems, uh, my understanding is that in the city of Jerusalem, something like 70% have been over the past decade, the percentage of the ultra-Orthodox, which are sometimes called black because they wear black all the time, well, black hat. have taken over, and they're kind of like Bible Belt Christians. They're extremely, they're anti-science, they're anti -science. Oh, yeah, they're, they're absolutely. And they're like 70% of the population. Actually, they're, you know, honestly, the, the better comparison without the militant violence is the Taliban. That is, they have not only a set of fundamentalist beliefs, but also very traditionalist practices. Women have to wear very, uh, uh, very uh, unrevealing, concealed clothing, and anyone who doesn't 
is uh, stoned or ostracized. Um, now, even absolutely, you drive a car down their neighborhoods on a Saturday, and you, your car will get uh, stoned by them because you're violating their their uh, precincts. Um, they've begun to impose a lot of their public modesty issues, even uh, segregating buses and all kinds of terrible things. Um, and the challenge is that in Israel, what do you do with a militantly isolationist population? Now, if they were like the Amish who went out and lived out in the middle of nowhere, and, uh, didn't bother anybody. And, right, didn't bother anybody, just lived in their own community. There's one thing, but the problem is, you see, they feel responsible for everybody else. They've read the biblical prophets that say if you violate God's law, you're going to get punished. And it's not just you are going to get punished. It's not natural when you say that, but everyone. It's all right, you're in Texas. Everyone is going to get punished if some of them are breaking the rules. So they feel the right, even the responsibility, to tell you you're doing it wrong. So what's, so what's, going, so what's going to happen? Is, this is a very unstable situation. Well, I like to say that working in the humanist world, we are a non-profit organization. That is, we don't predict the future. There's no prophecy. We don't know what's going to happen. I can give you my projections, but don't take it too seriously. Um, I mean, my best guess... Uh, the birth rates will continue to increase, but they don't keep all the people that are born that way. There are people who leave those communities. Um, I think the big question will be whether the Israelis and Palestinians can find a way to work out what to the outside seems to be an obvious solution, but to them seems to be unacceptable on either side. Um, and uh, if they can do that, then uh, this population will, will be dealt with because the Israeli society will turn to face internal issues. As long as they're facing external issues and missiles and everything else, they don't want to deal with the internal divisions over religion and government. Uh, but as long as they're not dealing with that because of the outside threat, it's going to continue to get worse. And the question is whether they've gone too far. Because now, I think the secular public is getting mad. And they're getting mad because it's beginning to infringe on their lives. Well, part the of it is that the Orthodox are. people don't want to serve in the military. Oh, and the, and the secular people resent it tremendously. They also don't work as much. Because the men, if they were to work, would have to go serve in the army. But if they're studying Torah and religious texts, they don't have to serve in the army. So they study those. It's like a perverse incentive thing. If they worked, they would have, they would, uh, have to go in the army, which they consider not kosher. So instead, they don't work, and they study and live on welfare and charity into their 40s. And so it creates a very non-productive sector. The two most non-productive sectors in Israeli society are Arab women and ultra-Orthodox men. And you can't have 15 or 20 percent of the society that could be working not working. It's, not, yeah. it's just not sustainable because you're paying for them for everybody else. And then the military service is a big source of resentment because in Hebron, for example, you've got 250 religious settlers being protected by 2,500 mostly secular soldiers. And it doesn't make any sense to be living like that. Um, so it's produced a lot of resentment. And the draft law right now is something they're debating very strongly. They may start drafting ultra orthodox men into the army. Uh, and, Ooh, uh, boy, that... and the secular people would be happy to see that, although <laughs> it would be another problem for the army. Uh, but they would have to deal with that if they come to it. So I think the secular population is getting mad enough that things may change in the next few years. Going back to history. Well, then I want to make sure that someone else has a chance if they. Anyone else? Yes, please. Um, is there a reason that somebody who is, does not have a Jewish um, heritage would want to read this book that you're quoting from? Sure. I'll give you a few reasons why. Um, one is, it's a fascinating read. I mean, I'm interested in African American history, Chinese history. You don't have to be of a particular background to be interested in the development. And in particular, uh, the Jews have been at the heart of Western culture, either in their activity, in their function in the commercial economy, in uh, the development of international finance, in the questions of emancipation in the 19th century in Europe, um, or also in the imagination of the anti Semitic who believe that they are the heart of Western culture. If you want to understand, how something like the Holocaust or the Second World War could have happened, the background of anti-Semitism in its economic as well as its social and religious forms is clearly highlighted in the book. If you want to get a good background on biblical archaeology and how that related to the development of the writing of the Bible, the canonization of the Bible and its development, that's in here as well. If you want to find out about how Jews wound up in India and how Jews wound up in China and how Jews wound up in Ethiopia, these very odd diaspora communities, where they came from, that's in the book as well. And if you want to get a sense of what it's like to take a secular philosophy and apply it to a history of religion, that's what this is. You can compare the holidays to holidays in other cultures. The uh, religious, I mentioned the Pharisees and the Calvinists again. Who would have thought to do that? But that's only possible if you see religion as a human <coughs> phenomenon, which this book does. 
So, I mean, I'll, look, I'll say I'm biased. I, I, I learned it growing up. I think it's a very interesting story. It is my people, so I find it extra resonant. Uh, but I think that the, the explorations are of value to anybody who wants to be a well-learned person in the history of certainly early Western religion, if you consider Judaism and Christianity that. Um, and also in the history of these people who, for good or for bad, get us as attention compared to their percentage of the world population. I mean, Jews are 2% of the population in this country. In the world, they are like 0.5% of the global population. 99.5% of the world is not Jewish. And hold about 25% of the Nobel Prizes. And there's a Nobel Prize question and a lot of other uh, issues like that. So the question is, why does this group that's 0.5% of the population get so much attention? Why are they provocative people? Well, this book is trying to explore why that's the case. Is it available on Kindle? It is not yet available on Kindle. <laughs> I, I proofed it, and I sent it off to get the corrections made, so it should be available on Kindle within a couple of weeks. Um, you'll have to check on Amazon. Actually, all of our books are available on Amazon. Uh, I have copies of our catalog, but if you want to come up and flip through them to have a chance to see them. If you're really inspired and you want to get one, I'm happy to sell you the demo copy. Uh, it's uh, not even lightly used. It's uh, brand new. Uh, but also you can take a catalog with you and look it up on Amazon or contact us later. Um, and I know that this book called Jews in the Muslim World is available on Kindle already. Um, this book, Secular Spirituality, I'm proofing the copy right now. It'll be up on Kindle probably within a couple of months. And then we're going to go on to our other books to turn them into Kindle with readings. In the meantime, some of them are in paper, um, and provocative people will be out soon in here. Cool. Yes, please. You, I may be incorrect, but you left me with the impression that you're implying the Palestinian Arabs are a relatively late coming to the Middle East, or to the Lebanon, you know, seventh century. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, there were Arab tribes long before that, the Nabataeans. Yes, that's the true. The yes, And Herod the Great is implied to be actually half Arab. Oh, absolutely. His father was a, a forcible convert by the Maccabees. And in, in ironic twist, he then wipes out the Maccabees himself. Uh, you know, the Maccabees, again, they're, they're seen in Jewish circles as the heroes of the Hanukkah story. But they themselves go out and forcibly conquer other peoples, forcibly convert them, even forcibly circumcise them, because they see their Jewish identity as an extension of their national identity. Uh, and the Nabataeans are one of them. So you're right, there are Arab-related tribes that go through there. I mean, again, OK, so are you Palestinian because you're in a land that will later be called Palestine? Or, you know, what, what, and also, by the way, we have to remember that just as the Jewish population in the land rose tremendously in the 20th century because of the Zionist movement, under the British Mandate period, the Palestinian Arab population rose tremendously in the same time period. Hundreds of thousands of Arabs moved from other parts of the Arab world into that territory for economic opportunity that was created by Western development. Uh, you know, the, the British took seriously this white man's burden. They built railroads, they built roads, they used labor. And so both the Jewish and the Arab populations are growing at the same time. So if the Arabs said the Jews are Johnny come lately, they can say the Jews, uh, that the Arabs are Muhammad come lately, because they both had populations come in uh, in the 20th century that hadn't been there for centuries. Cool. Any last uh, questions or comments? Yes, please. You, uh, you were talking about Maimonides, said, you know, talked about it probably had to convert and so forth this morning. You use the expression convert or die. Mm -hmm. And actually, the way I remember it from having been on the scene in southern Spain for several years, the, uh, for seven or eight hundred years, yeah, there, there was problem between the Moors and uh, the Spanish. Uh, but by and large, the Moorish uh, government allowed, uh, you know, everybody to live together very happy. You're, you're right. It was Until this, 1492, was it, was it, No, it was this new invasion. What happened was, there was a long period of time where Jews and Muslims Spain got along very well. In the 1200s, this group called the Almohads, who were fanatical were Berber converts to Islam, swept into uh, Spain. It was sort of a response to the beginning of the Reconquista, the Reconquest. They swept into Spain, and they actually made it worse for the Jews in the Muslim part of Spain because of this convert or die mentality. And a lot of Jews fled from the Arab part of Spain to the Christian part of Spain, which, by the way, is where they got their language, which today is called Ladino, or Judeo-Spanish. They didn't get it from the Arabs. They got it from living under Christian Spain between, say, 1240 and 1492. It wasn't until 1390, when the Inquisition begins, that it begins to get worse in the Christian part of Spain, and then they flee back to Granada, which is where the Muslims are still in control until 1492. It's the last holdout. 
So this golden age of Spain has sort of two stages. There's the under Muslim rule stage from, we'll say, 800 to about 1200. And then there's under Christian Spain for another 150 years until that goes down with the Inquisition. And then finally, there's sort of in between both, and it's that last 100 years that, where the community really deteriorates tremendously. Yeah. So you're right that by and large there was a long period of tolerance, but um, it also uh, wasn't good under the Maimonidean period. The last thing I'll point out is, you always have to ask who's writing the history, and that doesn't only apply to the Bible. The major Jewish historians who began writing modern Jewish history were a school called the Wissenschaft des Judentums, which means uh, Jewish studies or Jewish science. But they began writing in the 19th century, when Jews were not fully emancipated in Germany, where they were writing. And so they would often use the golden age of Spain as an argument to say, look at how wonderful and creative we were in that period. You should let us be as integrated now as we were then. Give us the vote, let us serve in the army, and uh, serve in the bureaucracy, and uh, become lawyers, go to universities, all these things. So it was written as an argument. So again, you have to ask the question, just like with the Bible, how, how true is this? How much of this is spin and positive emphasis? Um, by and large, in the Middle Ages, it was much preferable to live under Muslim rule than it was to live under Christian rule. You didn't have as many pogroms or riots. You didn't have expulsions, because Jews were expelled, by the way, not only from Spain in 1492, but they were expelled from France in 1390, and from England in 1290. So they, they were basically gone from Western Europe by, 14, by 1492. They left Portugal in 1497, That's when the Inquisition got there. Um, but in Muslim countries, they were able to live as second-class citizens, but they were able to live relatively stable lives for long periods of time. Different countries were different. Iran was worse. Uh, Egypt was generally very good. Um, you know, uh, Algeria was OK, just depending on where you were and what the time period was. Uh, but that's, that's one of the challenges in looking back at history today. Jews are much happier living in the Christian world than they would be living in the Muslim world. Times change. So yes. it's kind of along those lines, but where did the uh, concept of dhimmi come from in the Muslim world? All right, so uh, <coughs> the dhimmi is a concept of a tolerated minority. Um, for Muslim thought, you could, when you conquered people, you wanted them to become Muslim, but there were two groups who would be tolerated. Those are people that have a written monotheistic revelation. Of the book, as they say. Yeah, the people of the book, right. The Ahl al-Kitab, which is actually where that phrase, the Jews as people of the book, comes from. It's not a Jewish phrase. It's a Muslim phrase applied to Jews. Uh, that means then adopted. Um, I like to say we're people of the books, because we didn't stop with one. Um, <laughs> but uh, the idea of having a written monotheistic revelation gave you a tolerated status, if you were Christian or if you were Jewish. What that meant was, you had certain rules. You couldn't build your houses of worship too high. They couldn't be higher than a mosque. You couldn't uh, blow your shofars or ring your bells too loud. Uh, you couldn't be too demonstrative. In certain times and places, there were discriminatory rules about, like uh, a Jew walking into a town in, uh, in Persia could only wear one shoe. Uh, sometimes they had to wear certain markers or hats, or um, they couldn't wear swords. They had to be a disarmed population. So they had a kind of second class, and they had to pay a special tax. It was called the jizya. It was an additional tax for non-Muslims. But if you were willing to pay that additional tax, and you were willing to live with these mild, mild disabilities, you could live where you wanted to. You could have your rabbis control all your personal status. You didn't have to go to imams for that. You could make a living in just about any profession you wanted to. Uh, you could move from town to town. You weren't restricted in your movement. Um, and so they had these freedoms that made life endurable. The problem is that no one would want to go back to that from a position of equality. Occasionally, you hear a Hamas, which is the um, fundamentalist Muslim group based in Gaza now, but also with other branches elsewhere, um, say that they're happy to let the Jews stay living in what they will call Greater Palestine as long as they live under the banner of Islam. What that means is go back to your demi status, go back to your second class status, but no one will accept that once you've had the experience of being a full and equal citizen without these kind of ethnic disabilities. I mean, in, in, in all honesty, I can use this language here, um, for the Hamas mentality, for the fundamentalist Muslim mentality, the Jews living in Israel where you have Jews in charge of Arabs means the Jews are being uppity. They're uppity, they need to be put back in their place, right? That was the model. They're second class and they need to stay second class. They can stay, but they have to stay second class. And that was the Dibby model that, again, was manageable in the Middle Ages compared to expulsions and riots in Europe, but certainly uh, no model for today. I, Much better. Than I kind of want to dispute that characterization of here. Okay. Because it's not put in a proper context. It's the 7th century. 
and people come in and say there are some rights that you have that are independent. Well, one might consider it that in the seventh century, it was kind of a chance. Yes, I, yeah. I'll accept that. The Absolutely. other thing about the tax, and just for those that don't know me, my name is Mohammed, and I happen to be from Algeria. Oh, so my father's family is from Syria. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it is not something that comes to the standard of today. Right. But in the seventh century, I don't know. I wasn't there. But yeah. The other thing too is on the tax. If people keep on repeating that, but the non-Muslims were not obligated to pay the Muslim tax. Right. The, 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 and their obligation. And everybody charity. wants to get their share of money. So yes, yes. You, you cannot pay, you're not a Muslim, you cannot pay the Muslim tax. So they invented a tax. Another, I mean, they invented it. It was just another tax. And, and what are the, the so other what? advantage that you had with that tax is you didn't have to fight in the military. That's true, but you also weren't able to defend yourself because oh, you couldn't wear swords. Well, no, you were supposed to get protection from the. Yeah, it could be, and it depended on the time and place. It could be protection or it could be protection, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, one other example. Um, you know, there was a provision in the, in, uh, there was a document called the Pact of Omara, which was sort of the, the template for Dimi and, uh, and uh, Muslim relations. And there was one provision that said that you're not allowed to repair your houses of worship, that you can have them, but. The subject happens, you know, you can't sort of keep them fancy and shiny. So the question is raised, you know, depending on the time and the place, well, what if they just happen to get damaged in an incident, right? Well, or, I mean, if it's an earthquake or if it's just the passage of time, it's one thing, but you could imagine that there could be an incident and something would happen. So one example that actually we're down to the benefit of Jewish historians, um, there's a tradition in Jewish life that you're supposed to bury documents that have the name of God written on them. Put them in a place called the Geniza, which is a special storehouse, and then you take them to the cemetery and bury them. And in Cairo, they had a Geniza, and they were taking their uh, material to be buried, and there was some kind of, they got too loud, and there was some kind of riot or incident there um, in response to that, in some ways with this dimly status question. Um, so what they started doing in Cairo was they never took them to the cemetery again because they were nervous it would create another incident. They just kept saving them, and saving them, and saving them. And then they started saving anything that was written in Hebrew letters, not just with the name of God on it. And they kept saving everything, letters, contracts, uh, wedding agreements, inventory lists. And so in the 20th century, these were rediscovered. And this is a massive treasure trove of documents going back to the 1200s. We have Maimonides' handwriting from documents in that oh, wow. But only because of this accident that they didn't want to keep taking it to the cemetery because of the incident. So, I mean, the, I, I agree with you that in general, the Muslim life was certainly preferable to the Christian world at the time. And um, at the same time, the Pact of Omar could be interpreted leniently or could be interpreted more seriously. Yeah, they were, I wasn't trying to defend the life. I was just trying to say when people talk about genies, they put it in the 21st century yes, context, right. exactly. where in fact these were laws that were enacted in the 7th century. I'll give you another example. In the, in the Ottoman Empire, they had something called the millet system, where you had a chief rabbi, a chief imam, a chief priest, and they controlled personal status questions. If you want to get married, you went to a rabbi that was under the authority of the chief rabbi. In, uh, in, Persia, in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, it was called the Chacham Bashi, because Chacham was the uh, Sephardic term for rabbi. Um, and that was, again, very progressive for the Middle Ages. You didn't have to go to a religious official or a bureaucrat of some other religious persuasion to be able to get married or get buried. Well, what happened was when the British mandate took over in Palestine, as it was called then in 1917, they kept that same system. And when the Israeli government was formed in 1948, they kept the same system. So now in Israel, if you are Jewish and you want to marry someone Christian, you can't do it in the state of Israel, because you have to get married in your silo of a religious identity. If you're a secular Jew and you want to have a secular wedding, you can't do it in Israel, because you have to get married by the Orthodox rabbi in your column. If you uh, have uh, a background where one parent might not be Jewish, as some Russian Jews do, and the Orthodox rabbi doesn't accept that you yourself are Jewish, they won't marry you either. Now, you can go outside of the state and go to Cyprus or go to the United States and get married, and then they'll accept it in a transfer wedding. And actually, Israel will accept gay mar marriages that are legal where they're performed as a transfer wedding, just like straight marriages as a transfer wedding. But you can't get married in the state by the Orthodox authorities. And there is no civil marriage. There's no sub secular option. So again, the same kind of example. Progressive for the Middle Ages under the Ottomans, just not appropriate for the 20th century. 20th century. What about the Arab Christians and Muslims? They can marry in their silo. Oh. But 
the, again, the official authorities won't marry them across the lines with each other. Yes, please. Does uh, the Black people discuss uh, the current situation in Israel and Palestine, and does it discuss the what the Arabs call the Nakba and the justice of that, and the followed by the expulsion of just as many Jews from Arab countries? Yes, um, it, the book does touch on what happens around the founding of the state, both with Palestinian Arabs sometimes leaving, sometimes being expelled from where they were from, the Israeli, uh, sorry, the uh, Sephardic Jews and Eastern Jews leaving where they're from and coming to the state of Israel. Uh, that's all part of the discussion. It's obviously only through 2007 because he died in 2007, so it's not going to have you know, the last five years worth of developments. Uh, but it certainly is looking forward to um, you know, giving its best analysis of the state of affairs at the time, including the evolution of the state um, in the 20th century. Well, I want to thank you again for the chance to be here. I'm happy to chat more informally. I encourage you to come up and take a look at the books. If you want to find out more information about community histories in general, I'm happy to talk about it. I've got business cards. You can sign up for more information. If you do want to get a copy of the book, um, I have uh, some change. I have to remember where I put it. And uh, I also uh, uh, have a charge that you want to charge or write a check to the Institute. So again, thank you very much for the chance to be here. What would this discussion have been like in a Baptist church? <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs>